Hello again, everybody. It is I, the disembodied voice. And this is Christoph Biedl talking about Clevis and Tang. Just a reminder, um, please put your questions on the IRC channel, hash mididebconf online on OFTC, preceded by question colon in capitals. Um, there you go. Welcome, Christoph. So thank you. Uh, now let's get this show on the road. So sorry for the delay. Thanks for waiting. Thanks for the organizers for providing yet another slot for me. Um, something went wrong and we got it fixed. Long story short. But uh, this is about Clevis and Tang. Um, I think this is something worth to know. And so hence this presentation. Assuming you never really heard about these, um, I'll start with a short explanation what they are about. So Clevis, stealing from a package description, Clevis is a pluggable framework for automated decryption and Tang is a server for binding data to network presence. Um, so I think all questions answered and you can go back hacking. Um, those who disagree, well, I've prepared a little more. Um, this all is about hard disk encryption mostly, so I think it's a good idea to give a few statements in advance. Um, why do we do hard disk encryption? Well, it's not because we do sinister things, um, but different story and quite frankly, GDPR or German DSGVO helped us a lot here since now. We have a perfect excuse since this uh, stressed how much responsibility you have for other people's data on your disk. Now, if you lose your disk, um, you ha may have a problem. If however, you can say, yes, I lost that disk, uh, but the data is unavailable to whoever, whoever has it now, uh, still a lot of trouble for you, but not trouble with the data protection. Um, how does encryption work? Um, well, we all refer now to LUX, that's the Linux Unified Key Setup. Um, initially created in 2004, it underwent a major on-disk format change that was that skillfully done. Thank you guys. You barely even notice. Now we are now in version two and actually current Debian stable uh, already uses the new format by default. Um, I will not going to discuss, I will not go to the, um, discuss the area of ciphers, uh, key lengths and all that stuff. That's low level cryptography, completely different story and honestly not needed here. Um, we just rely on looks. We have a passphrase we hand over to looks that will open the device and we are fine. Um, and mandatory XKCD reference, uh, those who know, you should know it by number even, that's the number 538. If you need a short reminder, I'll present it for a second. That's uh, honestly a not so funny story. Uh, just because your data is encrypted does not mean your data is secure against everybody. And if you're dealing some, with someone who is ruthless enough to break the laws or make the laws, sometimes no big difference, uh, they will, as always, attack the weakest chain in your encryption scheme, and that is you. So uh, brute force can be used against algorithms or, uh, and can be used against person as well, against people as well. Not funny at all, but uh, just keep this in mind all the time. So, however, um, I, when I, I created this presentation, I said we have an unlocking problem. And it boils down to we have this passphrase that will open the looks partition. And that passphrase must be accessible only to those who are allowed to actually use the machine else you completely defeat the idea of encryption. So we have now an encrypted disk and it boots up and somehow we have to bring that passphrase to the machine. 
if it's your computer, your notebook right before you, no big deal. Uh, you can wait for a prompt to happen and then you can enter your passphrase. If you have a single remote machine, you can use techniques like drop beer in a drum FS that provides a SSH server where you can log into and do quite the same. However, this doesn't scale. And this all is about automating the pro this process and so easily do it for hundred or even thousands of machines. Another approach is to store the secret on a second medium, not secret, the passphrase, I'm sorry. Um, so like a USB flash drive and instruct the, the bootloader to look for that uh, secret over there. Works, works like a charm. Actually, I'm still using this in some places. Um, this is fine if your only concern is that your disk is dying and you want to throw it away or RMA it. Um, since without that medium that holds the encryption key, the passphrase, uh, whoever has the disk can not benefit from the data on it. Um, this, however, is a bit of a problem uh, if somebody steals your entire computer with that flash drive connected. And possibly it might be a problem if you have many, many machines because this means dealing with more hardware and all that is along, comes along. So subsequently, you might want to, uh, how shall I say, to have that, that passphrase storage as a service um, and put it on some special server that holds the passphrase and not for you, but all for all other machines in your data center. And when you need it, you can fetch it from there. This goes by the name of key escrow. And I cannot stress enough that this is a horrible idea. Uh, it is possible to do it, but I strongly advised against it. So first you may not assume that your network is clean in 2020. So you have to implement some kind of transport protection that's possibly TLS. You'll have to implement identity management, possibly X509 certificates. So you have a certificate authority, you have private keys. A uh, few things more, eventually you have authentication, then you need authorization, yada, yada, yada. And in the end, still that server has way too much knowledge about your network and your machines. And therefore it will possibly the first goal for someone who is really interested in getting into your data center. So in long story short, no. Clevis and Tang try to find another approach for this problem. And I think it's quite cool. So first, let me give you a big picture about this. Um, and it starts simple. Clevis is just a program that encrypts or decrypts a message. Big, big deal. Um, why this is later. Um, Clevis gets a little help from other programs and Tang is one of them. And now the connection with Lux. Um, the Lux passphrase can be something that Clevis encrypts as well, later decrypts. And so we can unlock the disk again. And one design point is this is all about automating things. So for setting up this manual inter interaction might be needed, but decrypting should happen with, should be possible without any intervention. Going a bit more into detail, um, and this is Clevis. So for the moment, completely forget looks. Um, this is just about Clevis. We have, uh, Clevis has a message, does and gets a plain text and we can encrypt it into some encrypted message and of course reverse operation. This is a symmetric encryption, nothing new at all here. Uh, perhaps just one thing when you might see, I wrote a JWE to de de describe the encrypted part. That's a JSON web object. This comes from the suite called JavaScript object notation and encryption or short um, Jose, Jose, Jose. 
Um, this is a set of RFCs that uh, describe how to store the bits and bytes related to cryptographic operation in JSON, something for people who hate ASN.1, like me. And um, Clevis uses this to handle the keys, encryption, all that stuff as well. Um, eventually, uh, Jose, the actual encryption operation, oh yes, um, there's a package by that name, guess who? Uh, that provides a program uh, or a suite of programs that do all the required operation, especially encryption, decryption using a provided key and parameters. Um, in the end, all this is open SSL. Jose is just a wrapper for it. Now with every encryption, we have this problem when there is this key. Um, and if you have the key, you can decrypt the message. So you have to keep the key somewhat confidential. Same problem as previously, it's just has been just moved a bit around. So how does Clevis solve this problem? Clevis does a bold move. It doesn't care. It doesn't have to. Uh, instead, Clevis moves the problem yet another step for, away. And this is something called a pin. So when I said helpers, that is what the pin does. So now, what does a pin? The pin does the operation I previously mentioned. Uh, it transforms, it gets the plain text. It somehow gets the key, usually it is randomly generated, uh, does the encryption, so, or, tells uh, Jace, uh, Joe Jose to do the encryption. And then that's the logic of a pin. Play stores the key somewhere where it can be found later. And that later is of course a decryption. Then the pin gets the encrypted part. That's a JWE. Um, the key, the pin has to find the key where it has been stored earlier and can use that to decrypt. So um, job of a pin is somehow manage the key and a really simple example, it exists as a proof of concept somewhere, is just to store it in a file. Uh, hopefully I don't have to tell that this is not the best idea, but it is something you can easily imagine. Now, one step further into this old story is Tang. Tang, is an implementation of such a pin. And when I just mentioned the file pin, that is a really, really simple one. Tang is quite at the other hand, it is quite frankly, mind blowing. So let me start with the features of Tang. Tang is a pin, so it has to store the key somewhere. No, it does not. Let me repeat the key is used to encrypt the input and then discard it. Uh, however, something else is kept and that is a bit of information that was somehow derived from the key using certain cryptographic functions and possibly you know that game, a function that cannot be reversed. So it is not possible to recreate uh, the actual key from that derived information. Still, this will not help us. However, it is possible to now suddenly to recreate that key, uh, trapdoor is this called, if you get a little cryptographic help from somewhere else, from another instance. But that other is instance doesn't have the key either. So it seems like out of thin air, suddenly the, the, this holy key reappears out of the blue. Um, you may ask yourself, how can this ever work? Some of you may think that this sounds a bit familiar as in, I have seen parts of this before. Uh, those of you, congratulations. Um, you know, if there's a story that is quite related and you hopefully had this in school, 
is this LGML or asymmetric encryption. And although this is not what we want, it's fairly similar. So I'd like to give a quick walkthrough LGML. Um, this is like Alice has a secret message she wishes to send to Bob, but the transport cannot be trusted. So it's not that easy. However, now what Alice can do, and you should remember this, Alice creates a key pair. A key pair is two numbers, two big numbers that are somehow related in a certain way. One is called private, the other one is public. Um, key point is the public key will be public and it is not possible to derive the private key from the public one. Bob does quite the same. And then Alice can create something that is being derived from the original secret message. Again, a function that cannot be reversed. And part of the, and the ingredients of the, this operation are, of course, the private message, Alice's private key, Bob's public key. And as is not possible to create, to restore either the secret key, the secret message, nor Bob's public key, Alice can happily publish this and eventually bring this to Bob. Bob, however, has another bit of information that is his private key. And this is allows him to, in a way, eliminate what Alice's private key did to the operation, everything else Bob has at hand. And therefore, Bob can restore the secret message. And now be honest, when you saw this for the first time, you stared at it in disbelief and say, this cannot be possible, didn't you? But hopefully you got used to it since uh, you possibly use this every day. So this is LGML, um, but as I said, this is not what we're looking for. We have a different scenario. Alice now has the secret message and wants to send it back to herself. And it should comfort you to learn that the first six, first five steps are exactly the same, bitwise the same. And the sixth step is almost the same. It's just Alice does not send the encrypted message around, but keeps it. Since the goal is Alice wishes to recreate the secret message somehow. <sighs> One way to do is um, Alice could ask Bob for uh, the private key. Somehow this is not acceptable. What however Alice can do, and this is new, um, Alice now can create another number, actually two of them. Uh, one, they again are somehow related. Send that number to Bob. Ask Bob to do again one of these cryptographic operations that involve the number Alice just sent and Bob's private key. And Bob sends the result back to Alice. Um, and again, it is not possible to, to recreate Bob's private key, so that is not in danger. However, we have now a situation that's like the previous one, just with sides flipped. So as a result, now Alice can eliminate uh, what Bob put into the initial encryption, and that was his public key. Uh, this is the part where you ca can happily ask a cryptographer whether this is uh, whether this makes sense. I hope so. In the end, however, now Alice again has the secret message. And this is what we have been looking for. So hopefully this was not too much cryptography, but I think it is important if you deal with cryptography, you should have at least a, some idea of what's happening under the hood, else you might even accidentally uh, completely defeat the secret the security of what you're doing here um from now on it's about to get easier um so putting this into this model of the pin tang of the tang pin we need the server the server takes bob's role uh, 
the server will happily publish or hand out his, the server has a key pair, of course, and the server will happily hand out the public key. And in order to later recreate that message, Alice or the, the pin sends to, his, to itself, it is required that this server must be in reach. And now there is a design to say, this tank server is by design not worldwide reachable. Instead, it's just in very limited reachability, like within a data center or within your office network or something like that. Since then and only then, if your computer you wish to unlock eventually uh, is within that network, communication with the tank server is possible eventually all the chain up, um, it will be possible to recreate the encryption passphrase to unlock and proceed. Now, this tank server I'd like to mention is nice because it is really, really simple. It, and actually it's even stateless. This, the server does two things. Um, it has two calls. The one is, please give me your public key. And the other one is, uh, here's a number, please do that pre previously defined cryptographic operation with your private key and send me back the result. None of these is really complex and it can be done without any knowledge of the client. So there's no database either. It is just small and cheap. And if you have an old first generation Raspberry Pi running around, lying around, you could use it for that purpose. It will be bored to tears. And at the same time, you can and you should use more of them. How that works in a moment. But right now, I think I did a lot of talking. Uh, I should take the time to do some presentation. And let's have a look what i have prepared i have been told that it is a little bit too small to be good readable um anyway um i'll i'll zoom into one of those screens when necessary just give you an explanation what we have on the top left is the tank service syslog also requests will be locked there on the bottom left, this is just TCP dump running, showing activity on the network. Uh, bottom right will lead later. And uh, top right, this is just a shell on another machine. And actually, I don't even need root privileges, so let's drop them. And now, encrypting a message using Clevis is well, no big deal. You say Clevis Encrypt. You say what kind of pin you want to use. This is a Tang pin. Next is a bit awkward. The configuration is a JSON object on the command line. So you have to quote. Um, it's a good idea since such, tang, such, such pin configurations can become fairly complex. So it's a good idea to have something that is extensible. And this all works in a pipe. So now we need a secret message that we want to encrypt. So let me up, make me up something like, no. And What's happening now? You see the tanks, sir, there has been some activity on the network. Oh, uh, I forgot. I wanted to zoom that. So that's a bit in bigger. Um, that's already the part that you've missed. Um, you can see there has been some activity in the network and there has been, a, so this was actually a request to the tank server. Now, one time we have to confirm the identity of the tank server because that might else be an issue for our, uh, place where man in the middle might uh, might happen. So the server pre presents some kind of fingerprint. You notice from the secure shell client. So you do have to trust that one and we do. And we're done. You might have noticed there was no further network activity. 
So the result of this operation is completely local. Uh, let's have a look into this. It got a little bigger. So you see the original message was just say 20, 30 bytes. Um, this is, well, partially because, oh, that's, that's bad. Um, having a hack stamp, we see this is a lot of apparently base 64 encoding. Uh, there's an additional framing that's JWE. I'm not going to explain this in detail, just show you the first um, first record in this. Um, a bit just right now. JW, I did, I chose S, that's wrong. It should have been an E, but it'll stay this way. So this is base 64, let's decode it, let pipe is for JQ, and, and since I know it's a bit bigger, I'll pipe it to less. And I'm not going to plan, explain everything here, that's not needed, but that is uh, what JWE needs to uh, understand how encryption had been done. And so you have some algorithms and stuff, and then Clevis has a section in here for example, the definition that says, okay, the pin used was Tang, and Tang dropped a lot of private information. There are keys here. You have, might guess where they come from or where they, they derived from, and eventually the address of the Tang server itself. So the decryption now, therefore, is really, really simple. We just say Clevis decrypt and read from that encrypted object. Uh, and now I'll zoom back because now we'll have again some network activity. I haven't started yet, it's just preparing. Uh, so now if I say I want to decrypt, you see there has been some activity on the net. This was a post request to the tank server and the result allowed Clevis to decrypt the secret message. Oh, by the way, don't ever tell it anyone. So um, now I'm on the tank server as well. I can st just stop it. If now I try to um, decrypt the secret, I will fail because the connection to the server was interrupted. Uh, just one bit I didn't mention, the transport is indeed plain text HTTP. But since the payload now is some cryptographic objects signed and all that stuff, that's okay-ish. If you want to, you can put um, HTTP on top of this, but I think it is not necessary. So um, back to the slides. Um, this is not the entire show of Clevis, it's just the start. Uh, you might remember there was this word pluggable. It is possible to have other pins instead of this Tang, although Tang certainly is a nice one. Uh, right now, there are not that many. I'm in the process of changing this. So the one that we have, remember the, the job of a pin is to somehow hide an encryption key and to restore it later. One way to do is, is one a supported way is TPM. So if your system has a TPM chip, you can store- uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, oh. Um, sorry, I got lost. So you can store the secret in that TPM chip and later restore it. As I said, more to come, for example, if you want to store it on an external, so again, USB flash drive, uh, that's waiting upstream where in a pull request. Now these are possibly not that great, but the other interesting thing you can do is you can combine them. So with some redundancy. So if you have, that's what I just said, you can set up, set up several say tank servers and say, well, um, I have three and I'm fine if I can and now let the uh, wording. Uh, let's spread that key among those free tank servers in a way that it's sufficient to have a successful communication with two of them, with any two of them, and I can restore it. 
Likewise, I can also do stacking. So I could implement something like I either I can get it from a TPM chip or from any two of free tank servers. And you can go further from there. I've seen a setup that went down four levels and it had a same explanation why it was done this way. Um, I'm not going to repeat it because uh, honestly, I already forgot. Just one point to mention, this is something not new at all. It is Shamir's secret sharing, quite a bit old. And yes, Shamir is the S in RSA. And another point worth to mention, Clevis is about encrypting a message. And wherever you want to encrypt a message, you can use it. Although for personal messages, I'd stick to GPG. But perhaps every way where you want to store a passphrase, uh, you can, instead of typing it in manually, use Clevis. So for example, GPG has a possibility to provide the passphrase via a file handle. I haven't even tested. I'm highly confident this is possible. So I'll skip demo two for, the, for time reasons. So I'll just explain now going up another level, how to integrate this into Lux. So you have a Lux partition and you want to use Clevis, possibly Tang. It goes as follows. You uh, create your Lux partition as usual and you provide an initial passphrase. Then you bind, that's how it's called, that, that device to Lux. You provide, in order to do so, you have to provide the pin you wish to use, the pin's configuration. You have seen this before. Then Clevis will create another Lux passphrase and encrypt that passphrase using the configured pin or pins, however this is done. And this results in an encrypted passphrase that is stored in the header of this Lux partition. There is a place for this. Unlocking now is straightforward. You just tell Clevis you wish to unlock a certain device. Clevis locates that encrypted passphrase in the header, thus the decryption results in the Lux passphrase. And this is handed over to Crypt Setup to do the unlocking. Um, you'll seldom do this by hand because we have uh, some integration or automation around it. So from an inner drum FS, are from Dracut, we have systemd support and also UDISCs too. So the friends of desktop environments can just heavily click somewhere and the, somehow magically the disk is usable. So um, I skipped demo two, but I want to show you demo three, which is now the Holy Grail. We have a machine here. Oh, just to let you know, I'm letting you run over a little bit. Um, you still have you still have time. I'm just going to give you a little extra time on the end. Oh, thank you. So um, it's actually the same machine I've been working on previously. Um, I'll speed up and just show you the tank config, the pin configuration. As you see, it's a little more complex. Um, I think I had prepared it. So let's use JQ to demonstrate it. And uh, now this is a set of two pins combined. The first line, the T defines the threshold. So two pins must succeed, or in this way, both communication with a tank server and the TPM chip. Yes, that machine has a virtual TPM chip inside. So now if I reboot and I'm evil, yes, the, I've stopped the tank server. So now I, oops, I reboot. We can see here rebooting happening, nothing new at all. And then it boots up and what you'll see next is it requests an IP address and then tries to contact, that should be on the lower left, the tank server, but the tank server does not respond because it has been switched off. Now it'll be nice and turn it back on. And you've seen there was one line scroll that actually signalizes, yes, I got it. Then there's a crypt setup taking some time and we did nothing, but the machine boots up. And this is where we wanted to get to. 
So this is the whole story. Now just to end it, a few more stories around it. Status in Debian. Um, well, it first appeared in Debian in what's now stable. So that's Debian 10 or Buster. Somebody maintains it, how to put it, uh, there must be a reason why I am standing here. If you prefer to use stable, um, that's okay for all the packages around Clevis. These are Tang, Jose, and Looks Matter, which I didn't mention further. Clevis itself is in not that good state. Um, there was no upstream support for uh, initRAMFS yet. And there are some really ugly bugs, and I'm not sure whether I want to fix them in a point release, whether the stable release team will permit. What I suggest is go to the version we currently have in unstable and testing, that's 13 2. Dash 3 will come soon and have a little bit improvement on the drug root side. And quite frankly, this is the first upload I consider mature. Uh, so if you want to have it on stable, uh, I aim to create packages that are easily backportable. Um, so is Clevis. Uh, it's just not in the Debian backports because I didn't jump the bur uh, because I do not have the rights to upload there. If somebody trustworthy is willing to do this for me, please get in touch. It's just basically upload. Um, how much time do I have left? Um, so I would no, I... say um, technically two minutes, but if you have a very quick point to make, um, that'll be fine. I do have one question waiting for you. Oh, only one question. So um, then so I'll far. take the chance to um, give credit. Who is behind this? Um, this is was initially developed by Nathaniel McCallum. And someone in time, some point in time, handed over to Sergio Correa. Um, that's upstream how you want to have them. They're friendly and contact is very constructive. The whole story goes by the name of network bound disk encryption. So if you're more interested in all this, this is the term to look for. So the Tang part. Oh, also sh I should mention these two guys work for Red Hat. So that's obviously yet another attempt by Red Hat to take over Debian, wake up sheeple. Upstream project uh, lives in GitHub in Ledge set uh, with these four components, as you can see, Clevis, Tang, Jose, and Looks Meta. And I'd say, again, to a point here, um, of course, I'm telling you this first because I think it is really something you should know and you should use. And of course, I want people to use it, more people to use it, so we can learn more about the things that are not in the best shape, we get more ideas and so on, and we can make this a better thing. There'll be a release someday. And, and finally, on a very personal side, don't ask me why, just a recommendation. Uh, your Lux petition has a header that contains everything you need, uh, everything Oh no, without that header, all your data is lost. And especially in the format one, there is no backup copy and anything like that. So do this on your own. So in case you somehow accidentally run the DD command on the wrong target device, you have a chance to get your valuable data back. Um, just saying. So that should be it. And thanks for watching. And I assume there will be some questions. So. No, yeah, I think I've, I've got two slides. questions for you now. The first one is, um, if you need to tofu tangdi, does that mean it needs to keep its private key somewhere permanently? And if it does, isn't that technically state? <sighs> well, ask a computer scientist about this. Um, I consider state something that is immutable. Uh, no, that is that is constantly changing. And I consider a key pair something that is more or less static. So I don't think this is, my, at least it's not my understanding of state. People might disagree here. And the other question is, has Upstream had to demonstrate their security response yet? And if so, how did it go? Um, perhaps rephrase that question. I'm not sure whether I got it right. Um, so 
as far as I know, there haven't been any security issues yet. So is this an answer to your question? Find out in a second. We have some delay on the stream. Oh, oh and apparently I don't have access to IOC right now. So just we have to wait. Um, in preparing this presentation, of course, that's why I do this. I had to think a lot about what's happening here. And I found some places where I get the feeling of mm, this possibly is a problem. So I'll have a closer look into the whole story again. And hopefully I'll find that, no, it's not an issue here. But um, like in everything that deals with cryptography, um, you might be surprised in the weirdest places about what is going on. So um, perhaps now we have um, gapped the delay. Else, I don't know what else to do. I think that's it. So um, thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. Uh, that's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow.